Good afternoon, everyone. And if you happen to be in a different time zone right now, I'll also add good morning and good evening. Welcome back to the 2021 Portsmouth Institute Virtual Summer Conference. Hopefully a year from now, we'll all be able to gather here on this beautiful campus on Narragansett Bay on a beautiful spring day, just like today, and perhaps be together in person at Portsmouth Abbey. I first want to extend my appreciation to Chris Fisher and Jordan Size for their kind invitation to moderate this session. They work very hard all year long on the Institute's various programs and initiatives. The culmination of their efforts takes place in June, right now in fact, with a stellar gathering of equally stellar speakers, panelists, scholars, and writers, as is evidenced by this year's lineup, including my guest, John Cavadini. Before I go much further, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsor for all three programs on this, the final day of the Institute, and that would be Wyoming Catholic College. So thank you to Mr. Glenn Arbery and his faculty and staff who do such an amazing job with their students, some of whom we know quite well. My name is Brother Sixtus Roslevich. I'm a Benedictine monk, originally of the St. Louis Abbey in Missouri. I've been living and working here at Portsmouth Abbey in Rhode Island for the past two years, and I serve the community in two main areas. First, I'm the director of Oblates, as well as the director of Vocations, both of which involve an outreach ministry throughout New England and beyond. I grew up in Northeastern Pennsylvania, the grandson of an anthracite coal miner who died in 1970 at age 82 of anthracilicosis, better known as black lung disease. He was proud to be a member for over 50 years of the United Mine Workers. Less than 10 years later, I became a member of the United Scenic Artists, Local 350. Unlike John Cavadini, who says he never met Dorothy Day, I'm humbled to say that I once met Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers during his 1970s campaign to boycott non-union grapes and lettuce. Our format today for this session uh, may already be familiar to you. Our speaker will deliver his remarks for uh, about 30 minutes, after which I shall ask a couple of questions to get the ball rolling. You, the viewers, will be able to submit your own questions throughout the entire talk using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. As I said today, our guest is John C. Cavadini. He's the professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame, where he joined the faculty in 1990. He also serves as the McGrath Cavadini Director of the McGrath Institute for Church Life. He teaches, studies, and publishes in the area of patristic theology and in the field of its early medieval reception. He has served a five-year term on the International Theological Commission, having been appointed by Pope Benedict XVI. In 2018, John received the Monica K. Helwig Award from the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities for outstanding contributions to Catholic intellectual life. When my colleagues at Portsmouth in St. Louis heard that I was given the task of introducing, introducing Mr. Cavadini, they sent me emails texts, and even phone messages relating anecdotes about him, all positive. I have time to only share one about his work at Yale. John grew up in North Haven, Connecticut, and this story comes from a friend in East Haven who studied under John. I'm told that when John was working on his PhD at Yale in New Haven in the 1980s, he made money by working on a garbage truck which began making its daily rounds at 3 a.m. I think you'll agree that a, a young man who spent time as a true blue collar Catholic worker while studying to become a Catholic scholar is the right person to talk to us about the marginalized and Christian love. So please welcome Dr. John Cavadini. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Sixtus, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you for reminding me of those days. Um, 
which are actually very dear to me. Thanks too to Kristen Jordan. Uh, and I'm honored to be have been invited and to be able to speak. So friends, here's my talk on, on the margin, marginalized and Christian love. We read in the entry for October, in Dorothy's days on pilgrimage, that, quote, the stink of the world's injustice and the world's indifference is all around us. The smell of the dead rat, the smell of acrid oil from the engines of the Pennsylvania Railroad, the smell of boiled bones from Swifts, she's in Harrisburg, the smell of dying human beings, end quote. In the reader's pilgrimage with Dorothy Day, she does not encounter the marginalized <clears throat> simply as an intellectual category, but as a smell. Here, the smell of dying human beings and the stink of the world's indifference to their dying. But on pilgrimage with, <clears throat> with Dorothy Day, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> one also encounters a contrasting smell as one walks along. And that is the fragrance of sanctity, perceptible only to the spiritual senses, but nonetheless real for all that. In the October entry, we meet Mary Fracon, who lived on 7th Street in Harrisburg, running the Martin de Porres House of Hospitality, though she could have lived with either of her sons, who both owned fruit farms, Dorothy says. She does not need to leave on seven, need to live on 7th Street, Dorothy comments. And then she goes on to describe her care of the marginalized people, the discarded people, really, who also live on 7th Street, almost all of them African American. Dorothy Day paints a vivid picture, quote, of Mary nursing a diabetic, swollen, heavy with water, holding her up at night so she could breathe bringing the priest to her, end quote. And she continues to evoke pictures of those who Mary served, and I'm quoting again, Susie, burned by a jealous rival, oozing pus from her infected shoulders, cut by glass from broken windows when she tried to escape, nursed back to health of body and soul. Katie, dying of cancer, tuberculosis, and syphilis, her body dung now, indeed, but once a thing of beauty, strong, strung taut with life and pleasure, and now overwhelmed with torrents of pain. Lucille Pearl, dying in an alley, flies and worms, feasting on the open sores of her flesh. These women dying, and yet alive today in heaven, literally dragged into the wedding feast, dying happy and sure, and already before their death, given a foretaste of the life to come, end quote. Dorothy goes on to comment, how to draw a picture of the strength of love. It seems at times that we need a blind faith to believe in it at all. But then she goes on to evoke another story of death, the death of the little flower. And Dor Dorothy comments, quote, her death was just as harrowing in its suffering as that of Mary's Katie. Her flesh was a mass of sores. Her bones protruded through her skin. She was a living skeleton, a victim of love. Dorothy goes on to comment, quote, we have not such compassion, nor ever will have, end quote. Do we recognize this fragrance? The fragrance of the little flower, the fragrance of sanctity that emanates from Mary, Mary Freakin, and here especially from Therese, to whom Mary is compared. Quote, out in the backyard of the house on 7th Street, there is a little garden with sunflowers, marigolds, petunias. How little it all is, as obscure as the life of the Blessed Mother, and as little as the life and sufferings of the little flower, end quote. We may no longer recognize the language of victim of love, Though the connection to compassion <clears throat> should remind us that it is Eucharistic language. The language of Eucharistic love, of those who have so allowed themselves 
to be configured to and united with the self-offering of Christ, who is both priest and victim of love, that they are perfected in the spiritual sacrifice, which is the highest exercise of the baptismal priesthood. Dorothy goes on to make the link a little more explicit. Quote, someday, she says, something will be done. There will be decent places to live. There will be a church with the mass, with Christ himself in the blessed sacrament. Explaining what she means, she continues, yes, the nearest Catholic church is 10 blocks away, but just the same, Christ is there, most surely there in the least of his children. He has said it himself, that is, there on 7th Street. Later, in the November entry, which continues the reflection on the love that can bear to stand in the midst of the stink of injustice and indifference, and of the smell of the rat, that died in the walls of a tenement with no way of removing it, and the smell of dying human beings. It is a supernatural love, Dorothy comments, realized in the purgations of the sufferings it welcomes, a love which achieves an intimacy that we can only call ecclesial. Quote, true love is delicate and kind, full of gentle perception and understanding, full of beauty and grace, full of joy, unutterable. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, what God hath prepared for those who love him. And there should be some flavor of this in all our love for others. We are all one. We are one flesh in the mystical body, as man and woman are said to be one flesh in marriage. With such a love, one would see all things new, we would begin to see people as they really are, as God sees them, end quote. Such a love, she says, has a flavor, and also, I'm adding, a fragrance. For, as the bride says to the bridegroom, in a passage from the Song of Songs, which Dorothy had quoted earlier, thy breasts are better than wine, smelling sweet of the best ointment. Nor does one have to be a mystic or even a member of the church to catch a waft of this fragrance, so seemingly imperceptible in the midst of the stench of death of dying human beings. As Dorothy had already told us, in the ministrations of Mary Freakon, Katie and Lucille Pearl had, in the midst of the stench, a foretaste of the wedding feast and were able to die happy and sure. The fragrance of the breasts of the bridegroom, anointed for the wedding feast, clings to his members, especially to those perfected ones who have been willing to be considered fools for Christ, like Mary, living on 7th Street, when she could have been living on her son's fruit farm. In a literary way, Dorothy has shown us how the ordering of Christian life towards the marginalized towards a renewed seeing of those who are otherwise invisible or from whom we might naturally avert our gaze is not simply a matter of duty, following the instructions of the wise moral teacher named Jesus of Nazareth, which anyone who wished to follow these instructions could attain. Instead, it is here portrayed as an expression of love, an expression of the intimate one flesh union with Jesus the bridegroom, the savor and fragrance of his mystical body, a union achieved even as it is represented in the Eucharist. In a magnificent passage from the May Day entry of On Pilgrimage, Dorothy explains this idea in a way that evokes the theology behind it. The context is a discussion of disagreements among strategists for various modes and apostolates of Catholic social and spiritual movements. But here's a quote. But our unity, if it is not unity of thought in regard to temporal matters, is a unity at the altar rail. We are all members of the mystical body of Christ. And so we are closer to each other by the tie of grace than any blood brothers could be. All these books about discrimination are thinking in terms of human brotherhood, of our responsibility one for another, 
we are our brother's keeper, and all men are our brothers, whether they be Catholic or not. But of course, the tie that binds Catholics is closer, the tie of grace. We partake of the same food, Christ. We put off the old man and put on Christ. The same blood flows through our veins, Christ's. We are the same flesh, Christ's, end quote. But then, to make sure we do not conceive the illusion that the church is a kind of self-enclosed club of intimately connected elite intended to privilege its own members flowing with the blood of Christ over the rest of humanity, Dorothy adds, drawing from a good Augustinian well, quote, but all men are members or potential members as St. Augustine says, and there is no time with God so who are we to know the degree of separation between us and the communist, the unbaptized, the God-hater, who may tomorrow, like St. Paul, love Christ, end quote. The church is precisely not a sect, not enjoined or allowed to close in on itself in self-congratulation for being the body of so great a head. I'm echoing Augustine here, you'll see you see. You, you recognize. But the love which binds it together and makes it what it is impels us to love outward to all of humanity, members or potential members. It's the very love that binds the church together as church, the very intimacy of it that opens our eyes to a new way of seeing people, including and especially the otherwise invisible, but certainly smellable Susie Katie, and Lucille Pearl. The Augustinian theology, which, which has flowed into the literary production of Dorothy Day's journalism and social and spiritual writing, rises to articulation even more explicitly in another contemporary Augustinian, Benedict XVI. And we have only to look at his first encyclical to see this. Speaking of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which we can contemplate in St. John's image of the pierced heart of Christ. And from this contemplation, Benedict says, we can understand the starting point of this encyclical letter, God is love. Benedict continues, Jesus gave this act of oblation, an enduring presence through his institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. He anticipated his death and resurrection by giving his disciples in the bread and wine, his very self, his body and blood as the new manna. The Eucharist draws us into Jesus's act of self oblation. More than just statically receiving the incarnate logos, we enter into the very dynamic of his self giving. The imagery of marriage between God and Israel is now realized in a previously inconceivable way. It had meant standing in God's presence, but now it becomes union with God through sharing in Jesus' self-gift, sharing in his body and blood, end quote. But being drawn into Jesus' self-gift creates what Benedict calls a sacramental mysticism, one which he says is social in character. It is intrinsically social. For quote, in sacramental communion, I become one with the Lord like all the other communicants. As St. Paul says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Therefore, Benedict continues, union with Christ is also union with all those to whom he gives himself. I cannot possess Christ just for myself. I can belong to him only in union with all those who have become or will become his own. This nearly directly echoes the passage from Dorothy Day cited above because it's drawn from the same theology and sensibility. Dorothy talks about members or potential members. Benedict is saying, 
who have become or will become his own. So Benedict continues. Here is the usual contra here the usual contraposition between worship and ethics simply falls apart. Worship itself, Eucharistic communion, includes the reality both of being loved and of loving others in turn. A Eucharist which does not pass over into the concrete practice of love is intrinsically fragmented. End quote. Thus, the we that is the church. The we that the Eucharist creates is not a we that can close in on itself and remain fully itself. United in communion by and with the unreserved and unrestricted total self oblation of Jesus on the basis of this intimate encounter, as Benedict calls it, echoing, however distantly, the Song of Songs. I learned to look on this other person, not simply with my eyes and feelings, but from the perspective, what Dorothy would call the supernatural perspective of Jesus Christ. His friend is my friend. Seeing with the eyes of Christ, I can give to others much more than their outward necessities. I can give them the look of love, which they crave." End quote. Doesn't this echo what Dorothy Day had said just above. She said, with such a love, one would see all things new. We would begin to see people as they really are, as God sees them, that is, as Jesus sees them. Benedict mentions the example of Mother Teresa and the Eucharistic encounter of the neighbor in need. In her case, the most invisible and disposable neighbors on the streets of Calcutta, the love that forms the church is intrinsically and indefeasibly outwardly directed. As Benedict concludes, quote, it makes us a we which transcends our divisions and makes us one until in the end, God is all in all, end quote, citing 1 Corinthians 15, 28. It's important to pause here and to note though, that this ever expanding we that ends only eschatologically when all things are made new following Dorothy Day who uses the book of Revelation or when God is all in all following Benedict and 1 Corinthians. This ever expanding we does not obviate but rather presupposes the mystical body proper, the sacramental unity in the body and blood of Christ that the Eucharist creates. The Eucharist makes the church, as the CCC puts it. And it is because it is the efficacious representation or making present of the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross that the Eucharist makes the church. The Catechism comments, the church is born primarily of Christ's total self-giving for our salvation, anticipated in the institution of the Eucharist and fulfilled on the cross. I just love this passage. The origin and growth of the church are symbolized by the blood and water which flowed from the open side of the crucified Jesus. For it was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the whole church, quoting Sacrosanctum Concilium. As Eve was formed from the sleeping Adam's side, so the church was born from the pierced heart of Christ hanging dead on the cross, end quote. You can see the affinity between what the catechism says and what Benedict says. This means that the church is, as Dorothy Day said, the church is not reducible to a secular fraternal organization constituted by the will of the members to offer mutual support and fellowship and to do good works. There's nothing wrong with such groups, but the church is essentially different. To use Dorothy Day's language, it is knitted together supernaturally by the grace of Eucharistic communion into the mystical body of Christ, or in Benedict's language, into a sacramental mysticism, which is irreducibly social. In both cases, it is not a communion which we have given ourselves or could have given ourselves, since it is in 
and by a love that transcends and purges our loves based on natural preferences, likes and dislikes, judgments of like-mindedness, etc. As itself a social body, it is the presence in this world of the perspective from which Christ sees. Not, it's not the presence in this world. It, in the first instance, of any good work of ours or any good work, but in the first instance, simply by its presence in the world. It is the objective presence of that light, one could say, by which the marginalized, those who are because of avarice, greed, power seeking, bias, racism, and other forms of injustice rendered invisible. That light is objectively present in the world simply by the presence of the church. But perhaps we could say that that light begins to shine in the world, the more that members of the church learn to see the world in the light, which makes them members in the first place. They shine with that light, not with a self-generated light that could just as well inform an, a secular fraternal organization. The more they are able to give themselves as victims of love, can we try on that phrase, as outdated as it seems to us? Can we recall its Eucharistic resonance and realize that the foolishness we might feel in adopting such a phrase was felt by anyone in the past who adopted it? As Dorothy Day sees it, that would, that, that would not be the foretaste of heaven that Katie and Lucy and others received from Mary Freecon. And in the October entry in On Pilgrimage, Dorothy explicitly compares Mary to what is on offer in the persons of prominent secular, in this case, communist social act activists. It would not be the look of love, as Benedict puts it, beyond the provision of natural necessities, which renders visible those who seem useless, even from the perspective of the natural urge to do good. So, as Benedict says, beyond, namely, it would not make visible those who, um, who are beyond, you might say, the doing of strategic good at a certain point, namely the indigent dying, the unborn, the elderly demented, those whom it seems might as well be dead already, those who, if they died, would not be missed. We are the same flesh, Christ's. Lucille Pearl dying in an alley, flies and worms feasting on the open sores of her flesh. What flesh? We are the same flesh, Christ's. In a sense, it is the love of the bridegroom poured out on the cross that who makes that flesh, who makes human flesh as such visible because he bonds himself to us in that very flesh not in a community of social status, not in a community of prestige or of wealth or of prominence or of any of the other things which we use to overlay flesh, to make it invisible as such. Those who are only flesh are not seen. There's nothing to see but flesh to us, naturally speaking. So Christ unites himself to us like a bridegroom with the intimate love of a bridegroom who is one flesh with his wife in a union which is not a one social status union, a one wealth level union, a one possession of power union, but a one flesh union, naked of all the things we use to block the intimacy of flesh with flesh, to deny it to turn our eyes away from it. The church is the sacrament, the wondrous sacrament of this one flesh union. The church is the bride, the society visible as any other, but knit together through the eff efficacy of the Eucharist by a bond of love. It did not and could not give itself the love of the bridegroom. Formed into this specific visible and sacramental communion, 
we can begin to see the world with Eucharistic vision. We could say with spousal vision, without which we could not see anyone as members or prospective members of the church, whether in time or beyond it. This kind of spousal vision that renders visible the human flesh of the world that is marginalized, or as Pope Francis might put it, thrown away as trash in a thrown away, throwaway culture of consumption. This kind of spousal vision is anticipated, I think, in an unforgettable and even breathtaking contemplation on love of the church in Pius XII's encyclical, Missici Corporis, written in 1943, in the middle of World War II, as the atrocities of the Third Reich were becoming more and more known. As the encyclical closes, Pius offers the reader an exhortation to love the church and an elaboration of the grounds upon which we love the church. He opens this reflection as follows. Venerable brethren, in our exposition of this mystery, which embraces the hidden union of us all with Christ, we have thus far, as teacher of the universal church, illumined the mind with the light of truth. And our pastoral office now requires that we provide an incentive for the heart to love this mystical body with that ardor of charity, which is not confined to thoughts and words, but which issues in deeds, end quote. Pointing out that the church is a city made of living stones with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, he goes on to exult in terms that sound a little bit like boilerplate, quote, for nothing more glorious, nothing nobler, nothing surely more honorable can be imagined than to belong to the one holy Catholic, apostolic, and Roman church in which we become members of one body as venerable as it is unique, are guided by one supreme head, are filled with one divine spirit, are nourished during our earthly exile by one doctrine and one heavenly bread until at last we enter into the one unending blessedness of heaven, end quote. But then the tone shifts away from what I'm thinking is a kind of boilerplate and very deliberately so, quote, but lest we be deceived by the angel of darkness who transforms himself into an angel of light, let this be the supreme law of our love, to love the spouse of Christ as Christ willed her to be and as he purchased her with his blood, end quote. Then after mentioning the many gifts which we receive from the church, the sacraments, the sacred rites, the beauty of the chants and ceremonies, and even the sacramentals, for all of which we should love the church, Pius makes another move forward. Quote, nor does it suffice to love this mystical body for the glory of its divine head and for its heavenly gifts. We must love it with an effective love as it appears in this our mortal flesh made up, that is, of weak human elements, even though at times they're little fitted to the place which they occupy in this venerable body, end quote. We must love the church, he says, as it appears in the flesh of all, even the least of its members, for this flesh is one with its spouse through the love which, with which he offered his blood. And he really does mean the flesh joined with Christ's flesh, as Christ's flesh, even where we are more likely not to notice or to hold it in contempt. He says, quote, we must accustom ourselves to see Christ himself in the church, end quote, not to separate them, Christ and the church, as though the church were a natural organization created by our wills designed to talk about and preach and generally uplift and celebrate Christ. Instead, quote, it is Christ who lives in his church and through her teaches, governs, and sanctifies. It is Christ also who manifests himself directly, differently, in different members of his society. And he says, this means not only paying due honor to the more exalted members of this mystical body, but also, quote, those members who are the object of our Savior's special love, the weak. We mean the wounded and the sick who are in need of material or spiritual assistance, children whose innocence is so easily exposed to danger in these days and whose young hearts can be molded as wax, and finally the poor, in helping whom we recognize, as it were, through his supreme mercy, 
the very person of Jesus Christ, end quote. The tone of the encyclical grows more insistent as the focus shifts to those members suffering from the atrocities of the time. And it's worth citing this in full, I think. Quote, conscious of the obligations of our high office, we deem it necessary to reiterate this grave statement today, when to our profound grief, we see at times the deformed, the insane, and those suffering from hereditary disease deprived of their lives as though they were a useless burden to society. And this procedure is hailed by some as a manifestation of human progress and as something that is entirely in accordance with the common good. Yet who that is possessed of sound judgment does not recognize that this not only violates the natural and the divine law written in the heart of every man, but that it outrages the noblest instincts of humanity. The blood of these unfortunate victims who are all the dearer to our redeemer because they are deserving a greater pity cries to God from the earth, end quote. And then in a one sentence standalone paragraph used to emphasize the point, we read that in order to guard against the gradual weakening of that sincere love, which requires us to see our savior in the church and in its members, it is most fitting that we look to Jesus himself as the perfect model of love for the church. In other words, our love of the church should be conformed to that of the love of Jesus himself for the church. For we don't love the church on natural grounds alone, that's for sure, as though it were a natural or worldly enterprise. Pius ups the ante even farther, then appealing right off the bat to the breath, with the breath of Christ's love for the church. Quote, and first of all, let us imitate the breath of his love. For the church, the bride of Christ, is one, and yet so vast is the love of the divine spouse that it embraces in his bride the whole human race without exception, end quote. It's just almost shocking. This doesn't mean that the distance between members of the church and those who are not members is erased as though it were inconsequential. But it means that the love which forms the church, which makes it church, is ordered towards love of all flesh as such, as though. No, as through, in his bride and by his bride, this embrace is tendered without restriction. And so our savior, he says, shed his blood precisely in order that he might reconcile men to God through the cross, and might constrain them un to unite in one body, however widely they may differ in nationality and race. True love for the church, therefore, requires not only that we should be mutually solicitous one for another as members and sharing in their suffering, but likewise that we should recognize in other men, although they are not yet joined to us in the body of the church, our brothers in Christ, according to the flesh, called together with us to the same eternal salvation. You can see where Dorothy Day gets the reference you know, to those who are members or potential members. And time sees no difference. In a pointed reference to the hatred lodged against any group on the grounds of nation or race, he continues, it is true, unfortunately, especially today, that there are some who extol enmity, hatred, and spite as if they enhance the dignity and worth of man. Let us, however, while we look with sorrow on the disastrous consequences of this teaching, follow our peaceful king who taught us to love not only those who are a different nation or race, but even our enemies. While our heart overflows with the sweetness of the teaching of the apostle of the Gentiles, we extol with him, that is in the letter to the Ephesians, the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of the charity of Christ, which neither diversity of race or customs can diminish, nor trackless wastes of the ocean weaken, nor wars, whether just or unjust, destroy." End quote. I can't think of a passage in a papal encyclical to which the word sublime 
might be applied more aptly to the, than to this one. Not that that's a genre given to sublimity. <laughs> it is because the blood of Christ was poured out for the church without reservation or restriction. And it is that very love which makes the church, the church. The love of the church becomes love of this love, love of its length and the breadth and the height and the depth of it. Love of the church, properly understood, does not collapse in on itself to our triumphalism that is self-congratulatory and sectarian, but rather entails seeing beyond its visible borders to those marginalized, really to those despised, because in a way, they are just flesh, flesh naked of the markers we value, we prefer. To see that in this very flesh, naked of those things, is Christ. The church is the sacrament of this flesh, of its visibility, and of the special love, as the encyclical puts it, that Christ has for them, which makes them dearer to him. If we were to translate this special love into contemporary terms, we would get the preferential option for the poor, which enters the compendium of the social doctrine of the church at section 182 where it's notes that the preferential option for the poor should be reaffirmed in all its force. And it explains that this is a special form of primacy in the exercise of Christian charity, citing John Paul II. Pope Francis, citing this passage from John Paul II, reminds us of the theological grounds for this preferential option. God's heart has a special place for the poor, so much so that he himself became poor. In other words, the option for the poor is primarily a theological category rather than a cultural, sociological, political, or philosophical one. I'd like to add that it's also an ecclesial category. For the love which inspired the incarnation, the self-emptying of the word in order to live an authentic human life in solidarity with us is the same love with which Christ makes the church. We don't really understand the incarnation if we do not see in the poor Christ himself, who being rich became poor. If we do not see in the poor the limbs or members of Christ, Augustine, commenting on Psalm 3119, let lying lips be struck dumb, lips that speak wickedly against the righteous one in their pride and scorn, reflects on one reason why the poor are so invisible to us. Looking for Christ in this Psalm 31, we find him the righteous one who is scorned by the prideful because he who came so, so humbly appeared contemptible to the proud. Augustine goes on to ask rhetorically, are you willing, are you unwilling to see him scorned by the lovers of prestige? Are you reluctant to see him who was crucified, scorned by those who think it is a disgraceful thing to die like a criminal on a cross? Does it offend you to see him who led a poor life in this world, although he was the world's creator, scorned by the rich? Christ renounced all that human beings hold dear, not because he lacked the power to possess them, but because he chose not to have those things in order to show us that they are to be treated as unimportant, and therefore all who set store by such things despise him. So much Augustine. But despising him, Augustine reminds us, also includes despising his members, who do not have the prestige or the status or the money that are considered so desirable <clears throat> by so many. Here we see the roots, even in Augustine, of what we now call the preferential option for the poor. We prefer all of the things that cause us to scorn the poor. Augustine warns us that this amounts to scorning the Lord. It means we are not really even able to see the Lord 
the poor and needy man of the Psalms, who preferred to come emptied of all the things, including the riches we prefer. Augustine's point is that we do not really see Christ if we do not see the poorest and most marginalized of his members, because if we do not see them, we do not see the love which the rich became poor for us. If we do not see Christ in his poor members, we do not really see the incarnation. We do not really see Christ. Just as Pius XII noted, seeing the church truly and loving the church truly means in Augustine's terms, loving the love that became poor, that united the flesh of the poor with his as his members, and that directs our attention outward to all of those who are hungry and naked and in a word scorned. What does being poor mean? Gustavo Gutierrez asks. He answers, I believe that a good definition does not exist, but we can approximate it if we say the poor are the non-persons, the insignificant ones, the ones that don't count, either for the rest of the society, the ones who constitute a despised and culturally marginalized race, end quote. If it's not too much of a stretch to put it this way, friends, in closing, I'd like to say that we could summarize our contemplation here, drawn from the passages of Dorothy Day, Benedict XVI, Pius XII, Pope Francis, Augustine, and others. We could summarize it by saying that the church is the sacrament of the preferential option for the poor. Love of the church is love of the poor, if it's proper love of the church. And it is ironically, perhaps the purest and deepest form of love of the poor, because it is love of that love, which is the only love that can be the source of human communion without qualification or reservation. This is why the church is, in the grand opening words of Lumen Gentium, in Christ, a sacrament that is a sign and instrument of communion with God and of the unity of the entire human race. She lives, we further read in Lumen Gentium, like a stranger in a foreign land, on pilgrimage, amid the persecutions of the world and the consolations of God. Because on pilgrimage, because the only love which can unite all human beings without exception is not of this world, is not in the first instance a love based on our preferences, our convenience, our utility, our efficiency, strategy, or even our virtue, but on that love which, though rich in a way that none could be richer, became poor for us. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was amazing. And I, I think this has been recorded. So this will be uh, a priceless piece of um, teaching to have. Uh, take a deep breath. I, I had a thought, and we, and we do have some questions from the outside. But um, of course, we're talking about all of this uh, as the country and the world are sort of winding down, we're told, from the pandemic. Before we began today, you described some of what you were going through at Notre Dame uh, at, a, at a university level. Of course, we've been going through sort of the same uh, protocols and issues and guidelines and restrictions, not only from our local bishop here in Rhode Island, but from the governor and, and beyond. Um, but something uh, struck me yesterday, and uh, let me just read this to you um, again in, in the context of coming down from this pandemic. Uh, this is a quote. I'm going to read it. It's very short. It's only about four sentences. It's a quote that could have been written yesterday or even last century by Dorothy Day or Cesar Chavez. Here's the quote. Many of the poor are ill and bedridden, but all keep a watchful eye on their neighbors and let no one deprive you of the care of even one of them, thus stealing the treasure out of your very hands. Embrace everyone you find in distress you such a person like gold look after him in his sickness as you would look after yourself as you would care for your wife your children and servants and the whole of your household 
In fact, that was not written yesterday. It was a, the second read Thursday morning, two days ago on Thursday. It's from a homily by St. Gregory of Nyssa, written in the late fourth century in Turkey. And I think all you have to do is ask any one of your local volunteers at the St. Vincent de Paul Society, and they will tell you that their work this past year, uh, because of what we've been going through, um, ha has just increased a hundredfold. It's amazing. Um, I told you that uh, when, when my colleagues in various places heard that I had to introduce you and uh, they wanted me to hear some stories about you, um, last night, late last night, an email came in from a brother monk priest in St. Louis, and he reminded me that he recalled a conference that I gave to the young men at our St. Louis Priory School almost 15 years ago, and it was based on an essay that I had written for Father John Cavanaugh, SJ, at uh, St. Louis University. I took a philosophy of human nature course from him. And uh, my friend remembered that I spoke about your very topic today about marginalization. And I wrote it shortly after my mother had passed away in a nursing home from Alzheimer's. She may have been one of these demented people, uh, according to the staff at the, at the nursing home. And she may have been categorized as marginal by some people. So I made the analogy in the essay, but also to the, the schoolboys, that when I was in college, I sometimes made notes in the margins of my books with pencils so they could be erased. I don't like to deface books, but uh, I made notes in the margins of the pages. And so these marginal jottings often elucidated, um, opened up a dense idea in the main text that I might not have understood at the time. So often the marginal jotting, the marginal jottings were more important to me when the time came to study for an exam. So in a similar way, the marginalized in society, the people, uh, they, they are indeed important, as, as you've made clear. And in a way, they help to enlighten the rest of us in the mainstream, in the main body, about our own place and responsibility in our community. And we have a couple questions. Before I turn it over, uh, a text just came in. I'm going to embarrass you. This was someone who wanted me to uh, uh, mention some of this. Uh, he studied under you at Notre Dame. He says, I did study under Professor Cavadini, and it was one of the singular privileges of my life. He says, in a day when theology has devolved into a mere academic enterprise for so many, Professor Cavadini remains a theologian in the truest sense of the word. He is the person described by St. Augustine in his 26th homily on the Gospel of St. John where he writes, give me a lover and he will know by experience what I am talking about. Give me a man of desires. Give me someone who is hungry. Give me someone traveling thirsty through this wilderness and panting for the fountain of eternal life. And he will know what I am saying. <laughs> Professor Cavadini understands precisely because he loves God and his church. Thus he is a Eucharistic man who brings out of his storehouses things old and new, communicating the beauty of God's love and thereby transforming the lives of many, including his students, among whom I am humbled to be numbered. Happy Father's Day. So, John, uh, here's a question from a viewer. What do you make of the tendency for Catholics to separate themselves into groups? one concerned with liturgical orthodoxy and one with social justice. Where does that division come from and how can it be mended? Yeah. Um, when Dorothy Day kind of refers to this in, in um, one of those passages I quoted, I didn't quote the part where she refers to it, but she's talking about arguments that people are having about, um, oh, the, the proper form of marriage preparation, uh, other liturgical matters and this kind of thing. But that's when she says, you know, we have to understand that the unity that we share, the unity that we have is deeper than those things. Um, it comes at the altar rail, as she put it. Um, it's a unity that, that comes 
because we're tied by grace, as she puts it, which is the grace of the blood of Christ. And so I think she's saying, maybe we could take these um, differences of emphasis or opinion and remember that's what they are, but that there's something that we have that binds us together that's deeper and infinitely more priceless and precious. And that remembering that might make us look at each other a little bit differently and notice the stake that we actually have in each other. I know that I know there's a kind of um, you know, for example, divides often you see it in student bodies between um, I don't know, maybe pro-life Catholics and social justice Catholics or something like that. Um, and it's like I I'm always trying to say, look, both of you have a stake in human dignity, right? You're defending human dignity, which is what Christ in uniting himself to our flesh, just our flesh, not our achievements, is uplifting that dignity of just that flesh. And you have a stake in each other, therefore, because you have a common stake in human dignity. And so there's a kind of maybe you know, transaction possible that might not have been, might not have seemed possible. I know these divisions are very difficult and we're seeing them all over the place, but partly that's why I wanted to think about this topic in this way, because we don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater as it were. We don't want to throw away our, our abiding awareness of what unites us eucharistically lightly anyway so i don't know that probably doesn't help because this is a it, it's itself a a problem on the i don't know practical and interpersonal level but what dorothy day you know talks about as supernatural that and becoming i know this language is outdated but if if you if you can think of yourself as a victim of love there's a there's a way in which it it makes you see deeper, right? Um, it makes you it makes you see the one who is priest and victim, and you're connected to him. It's a language that's unsettling, but it it cuts across a lot of it, it unsettles a lot of people in a lot of different camps. I don't know. I, I I just mentioned it because Dorothy uses it so much, and reminds us that it's a Eucharistic category. Thank you. Uh, there's a term I just learned recently from uh, the corporate, corporate world, and it's called siloing. And so many times, uh, a, a big organization finds people divided into separate silos, and they they don't cross over, and they really need to be all together in a large barn, I guess, not separate. <laughs> um, but, they, yeah, but they don't have that unity. They only have, you know, a sort of secular, fraternal, or business like. Link, they don't have what we're talking about, which is to make exactly. it different. Beautiful. Um, here's a second question. How does the Christian teaching of accepting one's cross enter into this discussion? Does a social justice movement divorced from Christian anthropology remain hesitant to accept suffering? As Christians, we are called to serve the poor because Christ identifies himself with the poor. We work to alleviate suffering while also knowing that it is precisely suffering that sanctifies us and identifies us with Christ. It's pretty meaty. Yeah. Um, Dorothy Day was sometimes pointing out how, you know, some of the communists that she continued to, to know anyway suffered a lot and were willing to suffer a lot. So that it's not it's not it's not precisely that I don't think that um, that those you know who are secular ad advocates for, for social justice aren't willing to suffer. Sometimes they're willing to suffer more than we're we're willing to suffer. I think um, sometimes, but I think it's more that they can't bring to bear a light on the situation that goes beyond a natural a calculus or a strategic calculus, which 
finally in the end is going to make judgments, right, about whose life is worth preserving and who should be euthanized. Um, it's going to finally come down to a division. Whereas what I think I'm trying to point out from these sources is that what, what we have in the church is a light that didn't come from us. It's a light, it's the perspective, right, of Christ in which he became poor for us. And that's what holds us together as the church. And so when, when, we, when we're willing to think of ourselves as a victim of love, to use Dorothy Day's language, or when we're willing to engage the preferential often for the poor, when we're willing to um, see in the demented and the insane, all those people that, that Pius pointed out, um, flesh, that's Christ's flesh, that's that's not and, and 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 that seeing is a suffering right that seeing is a, a kind of purgation by the very love that binds us together as church but it's that light because it isn't ours because insofar as we bring it to bear it always refers back to the one whose love it was and is um that's what we can offer that's different and profoundly different and that is profoundly in, and humanizing, right? As opposed to capitalizing, consumptionizing, classizing, or something like that. It humanizes. It, it, it makes us go back to the flesh that we don't like to be naked to the bridegroom. The flesh that we like is, is covered up by status. We like that flesh. Yeah, I want that. I want the flesh of a person who's whose flesh is covered up by a lot of power. I only see the power. I'm willing to take that flesh. But what about the flesh lying on the street? Whatever, I don't see it yeah. because it's naked. Anyway, so you can see how that's the very intimacy of the language of bridegroom and bride you know, is brought to bear here as a you know, revealed image for the mystery of the church, for the intimacy of Christ with our flesh. And that means all our flesh. Maybe that's a little bit too wandering to be a good answer, but I hope I made the distinction. It gives us something to think about. John, thank you very much. I think the only way this could have been better is if we were doing this in person. Well, I wish we were. So thank you. The next time I'm in South Bend, I'll look you up. Thank you. All right. I'll see you later. It's Yes, I just want to say thank you to the sponsor again for today's programming. It's the Wyoming Catholic College. Uh, thanks to them. Um, the next uh, session starts at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, and that's with Brandon McGinley and Chad Pecknold, and its title is uh, The Culture, The Nuns, N-O-N-E-S, The Nuns, Culture, The Nuns, and Christian Love. That's uh, session three coming up at 2 p.m. So God bless everybody. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, have a safe and happy summer. And again, John, happy Father's Day. I hope your seven kids don't mind me saying that early. God okay. bless you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening.